Hello, everyone. I hope everyone is doing well and excited for the weekend. My name is Dr. Ahmed Safwat, and I'll be your presenter today. I'm a general dentist, and I've been working with 3D diagnostics for the past four years as a senior treatment planning specialist. You might as well know me as Dr. Alan Stephen if we have discussed one of your cases in our online review sessions. I'd like to welcome you all to this webinar, which will be dedicated for full arch computer guided implant planning. Feel free to leave your questions on the Q&A box. They will be answered at the end of today's webinar. And if we don't have enough time, we'll send you all the answers on your email within a couple of days. And for those who are not familiar with us, 3D Diagnostics is one of the pioneers in dental digital support services, and we've been in the market since 2005. Throughout these years, 3D Diagnostics has processed well over 150,000 cases with thousands of dentists, mainly in the United States and Canada. We focus on providing turnkey solutions when it comes to implant planning, guided surgery, implants, prosthetics, and more. We have a dedicated customer support service working from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Eastern time, Monday to Friday for your convenience. And worth mentioning that our treatment planning team is composed of 25 in-house dentists. Today, we'll be discussing different case scenarios for patients who seek full arch implant rehabilitation. And according to the pre-operative situation, we'll get to know how to prepare everything and acquire the patient's data to serve for the best outcome. We'll have more focus on the dual scanning protocol and we'll discuss it in full detail. And afterwards, I'll be showing you how we treatment plan our full arch cases using the state of the art co-diagnostic software, which is one of the, if not the most powerful implant planning softwares out there. So let's get started. Let's start by some of the important criteria for a successful full arch implant treatment plan. Number one for me is case selection. When a patient walks into your office seeking full arch implant rehabilitation, this patient can be either completely dentulous or the patient could have terminal stage dentition accompanied by bone loss, periodontal defects, and so on. We should be dealing with each differently, and we'll speak about this in our presentation. Number two is the restorative approach selection. You need to plan before you start, where many things should be put in consideration. Patient's chief complaint, finances, oral hygiene, bridge augmentation, and the available bone volume in terms of width and height. Now that we know where we're standing and we already have an agreement with the patient on a specific final restoration, this should be our destination. We should be moving forwards for point number three here, which is recording the patient's anatomy using 3D imaging. And we'll need A, a CBCT scan exported in DICOM files, and B, a surface scan or an STL file which will be obtained from either scanning a model, an impression, or you can get that directly from your intraoral scanner. When it comes to completely dentulous patients, we will have more focus on the dual scan as mentioned before. Understanding the required surgical procedures is instrumental to implementing the treatment plan. This could range from an easy flapless procedure where you can finish placement of six implants in under 45 minutes, to a much more complex surgery where full mouth extractions, full arch flap reflection, and maybe bone reduction will be required before implants placement. Worth mentioning that preparation of your patient, your staff, and the armamentarium will be different depending on the case scenario and the required surgical procedure. Here we can see a CBCT scan panoramic view for a completely dentulous patient. And as you notice, this patient was scanned with his lower denture. And you can notice the radio opaque markers taken into the scan. While on the right side, we have a partially dentulous patient on the lower arch. You can also notice the significant amount of bone loss. And this patient would receive full mouth extractions, bone reduction, and implants placement at the same surgery. 
When it comes to implants prosthetics, you can restore the patients with a fixed type of prosthesis, whether it's an FP1 restoring the crown only, an FP2 restoring the crowns and part of the root, or the more common for full arch edentulous patients, which is an FP3 type of prosthesis. You need to plan before you start, once again, as the transition line between the restoration and the patient's gums should not show in an exaggerated smile. Worth mentioning that this will also be dictated by the restorative material selected, where a bar and a, a wraparound denture would require at least 16 to 18 millimeters of clearance, while for monolithic zirconia restorations, you'll need about 12 to 14 as a minimum. Another type of restoration is of course the removal prosthesis, where we can restore our patients with an RP4 type of prosthesis. This is an implant supported restoration, having a bar substructure, taking its main support from the bar, splinting the implants, which can have a distal cantilever, and this should need the same amount of clearance as the fixed type of prosthesis, which ranges from 16 to 18 millimeters. On the right-hand side, we can see an RP5 type of restoration. And this is basically an implant retained restoration, taking its main support from the ridge, same as complete dentures, but only retained with the implant locators or other types of attachments. RP5 restorations, would require a minimum thickness of seven to 10 millimeters only. And obviously these could be removed by the patient and hence would have the advantage of better cleansability and easier maintenance for oral hygiene. Dr. Chris Haggerty was generous enough to present a dedicated webinar, especially for implant overdentures. He covered it in all aspects. So feel free to get back to the webinar recorded on our YouTube channel. Let's speak about data acquisition you will always need a dual scan. And by saying dual scan, I don't mean the known dual scan protocol with the denture. For partially edentulous patient, your dual scan is gonna, is gonna be composed of a CBCT. And here we can see the CBCT segmentation or a 3D rendering of the patient DICOMS. And on the right-hand side, we can see the STL file. This one was taken with an intraoral scanner and as mentioned before, you can send the PVS impression or a poor model to your lab and they will be scanning it with a desktop scanner. The end result is a CBCT and an STL file that will be merged together and the planning procedure and the surgical guide fabrication will be done over the surface scan or the STL file. When it comes to completely edentulous patients, the dual scanning protocol is composed mainly of a denture, or you will need to reach to a point where you at least have a denture base with occlusion blocks. If a patient walks into your office with an existing denture, this patient is, is a gem. You will need first to reline the denture just to make sure that it has a perfect fit to the patient's soft tissue, well adapted everywhere. And our recommendation is to use a radiolucent reline material. After you prepare the denture and you wanna use it as your scanning appliance, you would be then sticking radiographic markers on the denture. These are called glass beads or fiducial markers, and these will be our reference for registration. As we can notice here, four to six markers are stuck on the palatal aspect, four to six on the buccal aspect, and these would be enough for our registration procedure. A quick reminder or some tricks while scanning your patient and the denture. As we can see on the upper left-hand side, this is the relight denture with the radiographic markers attached to it on the facial aspect. And on the right, you can see the palatal markers. You wanna always start with the denture scan. And while scanning the denture, you should position it into your scanning machine so that it's covered completely. The orientation of the denture in the scanner machine should be the same as into the patient's mouth. As we see here, this is an upper denture, so it's scanned with the teeth facing downwards, 
Well, if you're scanning a lower denture, it should be scanned with the teeth facing upwards. Another thing that you need to do is put the denture on a collection of cotton rolls or styrofoam just to be able to separate it easily on the software from the surrounding structures. You will also need to use specific um, um, settings on your scanner when you're scanning the denture, obviously using lower radiation. And once the CBCT of the denture is complete, you will then start doing the cone beam CT scan for the patient wearing the same denture, having the markers on the same positions. And this time, you'll be using the chin rest. As a common mistake, people would use the bite plate while scanning the denture or the patient with the denture. And this results in unseating of the denture posteriorly, which is not gonna be good for your dual scan registration. So make sure to scan the patient on a chin rest and also have the patient bite completely on the lower dentition or the opposing dentition, I mean, if the patient has a stable occlusion or you can use bite registration bite registration material to secure the denture in place. I'll be showing you on the software how a proper dual scan is made. On the left-hand side, this is the separate denture scan. This happens to have only five markers, as you can see on this view, three on the palate and two on the buccal aspect. And on the right-hand side, this is a 3D rendering of the patient CT scan wearing the same denture, and as you notice, the markers are in the same exact spots. Using code agnostic software, we can then match both together to achieve this outcome. And then we're ready to proceed to our pre planning procedure using code agnostic software. Today, I'll be starting with a completely dentureless upper arch case. So let's go ahead and check the case presentation. This patient was scanned with an upper denture with the radiographic markers, as we see before. And let's walk through the dual scan on our CT. As you notice on the axial view, the markers are completely matching between the denture scan and the patient CT scan wearing the denture. And this means we can proceed forwards with a prosthetic driven implant treatment plan. Looking at the 3D view, we can see the denture in place with the lower arch scanned in bite. Let's go ahead and hide the denture. I want to show you how we do the segmentation or a 3D conversion for the upper arch bone anatomy. This patient was presented with a big defect at site number six, as you notice. So let's see how we can avoid this defect. Before we do that, you always wanna take pictures for your patient to determine the transition line, as this will dictate the level of bone reduction or the level of the implants once you place it on the software and into the patient's mouth. Here we happen to use Stroman bone level tapered implants. We put two implants on the front and two on each side using the Olon 6 type of treatment planning. Once we have the implant level selected according to the transition line and to the appropriate clearance required for this patient, we're now ready to move forward with the implant planning. So let's go ahead and take a look at each one of our implants. On an all on six type of treatment plan, we usually try to avoid the maxillary sinus. This is an implant at site number four or number three, if you want to call it. This is a 4.1 by 12 Stroman bone level tapered implant. And here you can see that it has good amount of bone support. The bone density is a bit low. So we would always recommend undersizing of the uciotomy. Next is site number five. 
we try to avoid the defect as much as possible. So this implant would be slightly fenestrated on the mesial aspect. It's engaging the floor of the nose and it has some palatal fenestrations. Again, we'll be considering undersizing to compensate for the low density bone and also for the thin bone support on this implant. If you look at the implant trajectory, you might notice that it's inclined to the facial aspect. And we'll look into this in a minute. For the two anterior implants, I have a 3.3 by 10, place the site number eight. As we notice, it's as close as we can get to the nasopalatine without perforating through it. And its distal aspect will be exposed into the defect. Number nine implant is the same size, 3.3 by 10, also engaging the nasopalatine. Revolving around the implant, we can see it has good enough amount of bone support to be placed immediately. Moving on to site number 11 on the patient's left hand side. This is a 3.3 by 12. Following the ridge inclination. Again, this one has a facial emergence. And we'll see how to accommodate for this in our restoration by choosing multi-unit angled abutments. Last but not least, implant number 13, which is distally tilted on the patient's left-hand side, matching the medial wall of the sinus without perforating it. And again, it has decent amount of bone support. So if we go to the 3D view, let's go ahead, let's go ahead and hide the lower arch. As you notice, our treatment plan is prosthetically driven given the patient's existing denture. We can anticipate how the implants are gonna be emerging. A very important thing in FP3 type of restorations is the AP spread. Ideally, you will need implants at the key positions, which are the cuspid, first molar, and at least a, one implant in the anterior region. Here, we try to avoid the defect as we notice from this view. And that's why our implants are tipped more distally on the right to avoid the defect. Now, since this patient is seeking full arch implant rehabilitation, and also the treating doctor wanted to restore these implants at the same time of implant placement, so now we'll be moving forwards with our digital wax up. This is our wax up. We try to eliminate or decrease the amount of distal cantilever in our wax up. And let's put in our abutments or our multi unit angled abutments. This is the trajectory of the angled abutments. And as we notice, 70 degree multi unit abutments were chosen for the anterior implants, the right side implants, and also the two implants on the left. You always want to make sure that the trajectory of the abutments would allow for good alignment for the pickup. They are not interfering with the incisal edges or the buccal surfaces of the teeth in order not to damage the immediate restoration after the pickup. Our implants are in, and as you notice, they are a bit too much subcrested. So in this type of case, we need to do leveling or bone reduction. This is where the planning comes a long way. This is our bone reduction leveler. And as you notice here, we have four fixation pins, which is the minimum recommended amount of fixation pins for full arch implant surgical guides. These would aid in the stability of the surgical guide or the bone reduction guide, and then all the upcoming pieces will be stacked on top of that. This should allow for a minimum amount of clearance of about 16 millimeters. 
So let's go ahead and check that. As a matter of fact, I measure here 14. And I remember this patient was planned for an FP3 monolithic zirconium. So this should be enough. Let's go ahead and have a look at our reduction guide. There it is. So there should be a minimum of vertical acrylic support of the, uh, of the bone reduction guide. As you notice, the fixation pins are planned horizontal to the reduction level. And in this case, we'll proceed with a bone supported surgical guide. After the bone reduction is complete, we'll then stack in the implant drilling surgical guide which will be made compatible with the Stroman sleeves. Let's go back a step and have a look at the Stroman guided surgery sleeves. Since we're gonna have the bone reduced, now we can use the shortest drills possible to achieve a final implant bed preparation. Let's hide the wax up and these are our surgical guide sleeves. Speaking about Stroman, you have three options for guided surgery. Whether you wanna proceed with a pilot drill guide compatible with a 2.2 pilot drill, this is an option. Or a 2.8 pilot drill, that's another option. As we notice here, the sleeve is gonna be changing according to the diameter selected. And since this case was planned for full arch implant rehabilitation or provisionalization at the, at the same time of the surgery, we always wanna go fully guided, which is gonna be done using the fully guided five millimeter surgical guide sleeve by Stroman. Next thing is choosing the vertical sleeve position. So we have H2, H4, and H6. This is determined by the distance between the implant platform and the bottom of the surgical guide sleeve. And so here we have a bone reduction guide. Again, we can proceed with the shortest available offset so that the surgeon would have the maximum accessibility during the surgery. We can raise it to H4 or H6 according to preference, but here we're gonna proceed with an H2 sleeve position. For number five, this was a 3.3 by 12, which shows the five millimeter fully guided sleeve and an H4 sleeve position. And immediately the software will automatically calculate which drill length to be used and which drill handle to be used to go to the full implant depth. You always wanna make sure that the abutments are pre-selected and the angulations are done on the software before designing the surgical guide because this will determine the rotational markers on the surgical guide to allow for proper implant timing during insertion. And after the implants are inserted, you will have an abutment guide with the same rotational markers for proper alignment of your abutments for the pickup. Let's go a step backwards and discuss the drilling sequence or the surgery procedure for this type of patient. We have the six implant, implants treatment planned. We have our bone reduction leveler planned. And the first step to start with is the fixation pin positioning. As you notice here, this is a replica of the denture to be seating on the soft tissue. And this type of surgical guide will be used only for drilling the fixation osteotomies. This guide will be supported on the soft tissue as we can see here, and it's an exact replica of the denture. After the fixation pin drilling is complete, this guide will be removed. And then you will use the flap guide, which is again, an exact replica of the denture, but has two distal legs to determine the minimum extension of your flap. If the flap is not extended as far posteriorly, the following surgical guides are not gonna be seated properly. 
So you always want to make sure to use this guide as a reference. Next comes in the bone reduction guide. And it seats on the existing bone level. We hide the implants. This is how much bone sticking out of the reduction guide. So this amount of bone will be leveled, again, guided by this reduction guide. You should level it to the level of plastic. And after this bone is gone, we'll be left with something like, that looks like that. Afterwards, your implant surgical guide is gonna be seated and locked in place using these locking keys. This prevents the implant surgical guide from movement and allows for a more stable implant drilling and implant insertion through the surgical guide. With that being complete, the bone reduction guide will stay in place, the implant surgical guide will be removed, and you will have another piece that is called the implant or the abutment guide, I'm sorry, where you're gonna place your abutments with the rotational markers and with the pickup done during the surgery. This is our, this is our wax up from the anterior view. And this is our lower jaw with a perfect bite and with the least amount of cantilever distally. There we go. This should conclude our treatment planning for uh, the completely dentalist patient. So let's take a look at the other scenario. For partially dentalist patients, we have a CBCT scan of the patient and matching intraoral scans or STL files obtained from PVS impressions or models. Here we happen to have upper and lower models. The patient was presented as mentioned before with terminal stage dentition on the lower arch and the doctor would need to extract all the teeth, reduce the bone before implant placement. Same scenario would happen on the lower arch, but this time we're not avoiding the sinuses. This time we're gonna be avoiding the nerve canals or the mental foramina to be specific. Here we're using Nidan GM, GM helix implants. Let's have a look at that. And this was planned with an all on five type of restoration. We made sure that the distal implants are distally tilted to have the maximum AP spread possible. And hence they will be restored with angled multi-unit abutments. While the anterior implants are gonna be straight up and down inside the upper arch and take a look at the occlusal view. There we go. We started our planning with a digital wax up. You should always have an accurately planned final prosthetic outcome before designing your full arch implant restorations or full arch implant treatment plans to be specific. These are the abutments emergence. And on the right-hand side, we can see how the multi-unit abutment will be restoring the distal implant. And on the patient's left-hand side as well. So let's take a closer look at the drilling sequence or the surgical procedure required for this type of restoration or this type of surgical guides. Number one would be your pin positioning guide. Let's go ahead and hide the implants. This type of surgical guide, as mentioned before, will be only used for drilling the fixation of steotomies. This time it's supported on the teeth 
after the drilling is complete, this guide should be removed. And then you'll be, using, you'll be using the flap guide to determine the distal extension for your flap reflection. Then the patient will be dentulated and will be left by this bone structure. This will receive the bone reduction surgical guide, which is gonna be pinned in with the same pin positions. And there comes our bone reduction leveler and also the fixation pins. Once this bone is reduced, you'll be left with that. And then you're ready to place your implant surgical guide. Let's pay a closer look at the implants from the 3D views or the 3D X-ray views. So this is an implant at site number 20, the steady inclined, and we made sure that it has enough clearance from the mesial loop of the nerve. This should have good amount of initial support or initial stability. And it's subcrustal enough to avoid grafting within the roots. This is number 22 implant. We have the same size, 3.5 by 11.5 millimeter implant. As you notice here, we have a good bite in bone, good amount of bone support apical to the sockets. And this will be restored with a straight multi-unit abutment. Next is the midline implant. Here, we wanted to make sure we're not hitting the mandibular incisive canal. So we used an 11 and a half implant as well. It's beneath teeth number 24 and 25 exactly in the midline, as you noticed right there. Implant number 26, which is also a 3.5 by 11 and a half. Looking at the cross section, we can see that this has a lingual emergence ready to be restored with a straight multi-unit. And on the right-hand side, this is our final implant, a four by 11 and a half distally inclined, and this would receive a multi-unit angle abutment of 17 to 30 degrees. Some systems would have 15 and 30, other systems would have 17 and 30. So always make sure to check with your implant rep about the available angulations for the multi-units before planning the case. And this happens to be a need then GM guided surgery where we have the sleeves ready integrated into the software let me walk you through the drilling instructions that will be generated automatically from the co-diagnostic software. I'll make sure to go back to the previous case to check the Strauman guided surgery drilling instructions. But now let's focus on the knee dent one. Code diagnostic software printout will always show you the first page as the one that you were stopping at before clicking on printout. The next pages will show the implants used with their article numbers so that you can go ahead and order the proper implants. Also the sleeves used for the surgical guide. And if you have used the stock abutments within the software, you'll see them listed here as well. Then, you'll find a quick reference to each of your planned implants, with the surgical protocol or the offset, as some surgical kits would have different offsets available. As we mentioned before, the Strawman has H2, H4, H6, while the knee dent GM guided surgery kit has two available offsets of nine millimeters or 11 millimeters. The final page would be an automatic instruction sheet. And as you notice, it is bone density specific. So for instance, if we speak about the 4.0 by 11.5 millimeter implant at site number 20, 
we'll be using a 2.0, 3.5, and 3.75 millimeter drill diameter if this bone density is D1 or D2. You'll be using the taper contour drill for the D1 and D2 bone density. The drill guide to be used is up to 4.3 if you have high density bone. And we used H9 sleeve position or crestal offset of nine millimeters for all the implants. Any optional drill that will depend on your clinical evaluation for the bone density, you will have an asterisk next to the implant drill size. Let's go back to the previous case and double check on the Stroman guided surgery instructions. And here we have a question about knee dent before we move on to Stroman. When using knee dent GM implants, is it recommended that they be placed 1.5 millimeters subcrestally because of that in order to use the multi-unit abutments, are we using bone profilers to accommodate the MUA? Actually, that's a very good question. The guided bone reduction will be done to make sure that you have a flat level or a plateau to achieve the best leveling for the bone. And then afterwards, you might have the implants play, planned a bit subcrestal to that level in order not to expose these implants. You should follow the implant manufacturer recommendations so as mentioned here, the GM implants should be placed one millimeter subcrestally. And as we do that, we'll need to do some crested bone profiling free-handed after removal of the surgical guide and before placing the abutments. I hope this answers your question. Let's move on to the Stroman got the surgery instructions. Once you click on the printout, to load in a minute. Same sequence of the pages, having the implant numbers, sleeves, and also the abutments if available. Let's go to the final page. And here it is actually color coded as you notice. So for a 4.1 millimeter implant, you should be using the 3.5 red color coded milling cutter. Afterwards, the pilot drill should be used regardless of the bone density, 2.8 as well. And then the 3.5 millimeter drill should be used for D1 to D3 bone density. If you have D1 bone density, you might be using the profile drill accompanied by the specific C handle from the Stroman guided surgery kit. Same thing for the tap drill, which will be used only if you have D1 bone density very hard to place your implant in, and you need to make sure that the osteotomy is tapped before placement of the implant. And there you will have the depth stop of the implant driver, which is marked as H2. This happens to be the drilling instruction for a 4.1, as we mentioned, while for the 3.3 implants, you'll be using the 2.8 millimeter drilling cutter or the milling cutter, 2.2 millimeter drill, 2.8 millimeter drill is gonna be your final drilling for a 3.3 millimeter implant. If you wanna go back to the partially dentalist case, just to double check on one more thing, which was the available amount of clearance. Maybe you noticed that these implants were planned too deep subcrestal. And this was according to the surgeon's recommendations or requests, as this case will be restored with an FP3 type of prosthesis, but this will have a bar. So we try to achieve about 18 millimeters as a minimum amount of clearance. We can have a two minutes break before we answer all the questions. So feel free to leave your questions in the Q&A box.
we have a question about the extent of the palatal flap reflection. And as a matter of fact, 3D diagnostics fabricate the bone reduction guides without a palatal flange to make it easier for the surgeon and to make it less dramatic for the flap reflection. Let's have a look at the occlusive surface of our bone reduction guide. There we go. Another question is how do I make sure that the bone reduction guide is well seated or is properly oriented since this does not have a palatal flange? And the answer to that is that you need to make sure that you use the pin positioning guide as this will be your foundation to all the following steps. As we mentioned before, the pin positioning guide in a completely dentious patient would be either soft tissue supported like this one or the minimum that we can do for you is a bone supported pin positioning guide. The only difference between a bone supported pin positioning guide and the bone reduction guide itself is that the bone supported pin positioning guide would be seated on more bone surface. So it will be more stable and more reliable in terms of drilling your fixation pins osteotomies. While for teeth supported guides or patients who have teeth, we'd be using the teeth pin positioning guide. 3D diagnostics will always tell you if your fixation drill is penetrating through a root, just in case you wanna extract this root before using this pin positioning guide. I hope this also answers your question. I have a question about restoring full arch restoration um, and if it's done through the surgical guide? And the answer is yes, only if you're using a fully guided surgery and if you place your implants through the surgical guide. So you always wanna make sure that you're using a fully guided surgery kit that allows for implant depth positioning or implant depth control through the surgical guide because only then we can predetermine the implant position, orientation and depth stop so that the prefabricated restoration goes in place without any hiccups. Another question here is about indexing your MUA and the surgical guide. And our surgical guides are indexed to the opposing arch in case you have a full denture like this one, or in case you're using a teeth guide or a teeth pin positioning guide, it is not gonna be indexed, but it will be seated on all the available teeth. When it comes to indexing the MUAs, as mentioned before, we have an abutment guide or it's called the silicon index. This will do two things. It will accommodate for the amount of bone reduction, bone reduction done through the surgery. And it will also act as indexing for the rotational um, 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 indexing of your abutments. So the answer is yes, it's done through the surgical guide. This should conclude our webinar for today. I hope you found this useful. Feel free to check the previous webinars recordings on our YouTube channel. And regarding your CE credits, you'll be receiving, you'll be receiving them next week. Thanks for your time. Totally appreciate your attendance. Enjoy the weekend. Take care. Bye-bye.